In this video I'm going to talk about a, a new circuit component we're going to look at called capacitors. And these are a mechanism for storing charge and therefore storing energy, but unlike batteries they can charge and discharge much more quickly and much higher voltages, which makes them extremely useful in th different applications. So capacitor has two plates and you can see on the diagram on the right hand side you've got the one plate here, one plate here, and there's a gap in between them. And the gap between them is actually filled with an insulating material, and you sometimes might see that called a dielectric material. And it's this that allows a charge to build up on the plates, and then this charge can then be re released through a circuit in the form of a current. So a capacitors have a property called capacitance which is the number of coulombs of charge they can store per volt that's applied across them. So when you charge them up, you can actually change the amount of energy and charge stored by varying the voltage across the capacitor. So capacitance is the coulombs of charge per volt applied. So the unit of capacitance is the farad. Though if you're actually talking about capacitors, you will generally talk about them in terms of pico, nano, or microfarads, because a farad is a colossally huge unit. So it's usually the micro, nano, or pico scale. Much bigger than that doesn't come up very much, certainly not in small scale circuitry. So if you see one in a circuit, this is a capacitor over here on the right hand side. So you've got the two parallel plates shown with a gap in the middle. So let's move on and have a look at more detail. So the first thing you need to know is how the charge and potential difference across are linked. So what you can see in here on this graph is because it goes through the origin and it's a straight line, the charge is directly proportional to the potential difference. So previously when we looked at it, we had this equation E equals QV to calculate the amount of energy. But in this you can see the amount of energy would be the area under this graph, and obviously that's a triangle. So let's get a few equations down at this point. The first thing you need to know is the link between the charge and the voltage, which is going to be the capacitance, if capacitance is measured in coulombs per volt. So you've got this Q equals CV equation here. And to calculate the area of this triangle, of which will be the energy, it's going to be the area of a triangle is a half base times height, so half QV. Now, because of this equation we have above it, there are several different forms of this equation. So if we substitute in the above for Q, get half CV squared. And another format you can see this uh, equation is where they substitute in for volts instead. So let's have this last form of the equation. Half. So we've still got Q. And then we've got Q over C. So you end up with half Q squared over C. And you can make as many substitutions as you want and end up with more terms. But these are the basic equations you need to know about the energy stored in a capacitor. Okay, so obviously there are two things you can be doing with a capacitor. You can be charging it or you can be discharging it. And we have a look at discharge first. And what you can see from the graph is that you've got an exponential decay here, which tells you that with time it's going to be you're going to have something of the form of uh, this, so that that sort of equation going on here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to call the initial charge Q0, and then we're going to be able to actually generate an expression for the charge at any given time of it. So if we want to know what the charge is at any given time, so the charge is going to be Q. So you can have an expression for the initial charge okay so what you've got here on is we've actually substituted in for the expression and as it turns out with capacitors you actually get this relationship here e to the minus t over rc now if you remember voltage and 
the current were directly proportional, so that means you must have this other equation. So these are the two expressions you can use to calculate the charge or voltage at any given point in, in your circuit. So those are your equations of discharging. So let's have a look at some charge. So when you charge, you'll get a different shape of graph. You get this sort of form of graph. But you can still see it's some sort of exponential decay. So we're still going to have very similar expressions. So if you want to know what the charge is at any given point, we, we need to know what the final charge is, first of all. So we need something to do with the final charge. And then we want an expression for the amount of charge sort of added at any given point. So what you do is you get this expression here, so minus T over RC. And it's really not important to understand where the, exactly where these expressions are coming from, but to understand that what we've got here is you've got exponential decays and rises and that sort of thing. And we often get this shortened to... Like this. So similarly for voltage, you have but notice the difference here with where you measure the V0 or Q0 on the graph. Obviously that's the final one, not the initial, like when we did the discharging expression. Okay. So the last thing you need to know is something called a time constant. And it seems a bit arbitrary when you first look at this. So what you've got is the time cost constant during discharging is the time it takes to get to 37% of its initial charge. So to 37% of Q0 or V0. Okay, So that's when it is discharging. If we quickly draw a graph on here of it during charging, you'll see it's sort of an inverse of it. And it's the time taken to reach 67% during charging. So what if I just draw a dotted line of approximately where 67% would be, you actually notice that they actually end up with exactly the same answer here. So my sketch was a bit rough, so that's probably not exactly where 67% is. But what you'll find is you work out the time constant during charging and discharging, you should get the same answer. And those are the two conditions which you can measure it. So there's actually another way of calculating T if you have more information. If you have it in an RC circuit, or a circuit with a resistor and a capacitor, you actually find that the time constant of it is calculated by T is equal to RC. And the last thing to note is that obviously these are asymptoting, so they're never ever going to reach the, what, the final or completely zero. However, what we say is that to be completely discharged takes approximately you know, five time periods. So by that point, it's, the change is so small that you might as well consider it fully charged or fully discharged. And that is capacitors.